na ko to. Ay, naku. Alin, yung aso mo. Kinagat na yung kamay ko. Ay, naku. Ay, naku. Ikaw talagang terrier ka, ha? Oh, oh, oh. Alis, nagkaklasi ako. Ano ang patay mo? Aray ko. Bumaon, alin. Okay. Ayan. Oh, wait. Confirm ko lang. Nakikita nyo ba yung ano? Yung uh, video na halagay programming data structure C program. Arrays in C. Kita? Kita po? Okay. Kita naman po. Okay. Sige. Uh, simula na tayo. Nagre-record na to. Okay. Nagre-record na siya. According dito. Ayan. Okay. Write a program to print the following numbers in reverse order. We want to print these numbers in reverse order. That means this number should come first, this number should come second, this number should come third, this number should come fourth, and so on. Assume that all these numbers are stored in an array. Okay? Before starting up with this program, I would encourage you to pause the video for a while and try to answer this question on your own. I hope you're done. Okay. Let's see how we can write a program to print these numbers in reverse order. Obviously, we require a main function to start our program, right? And inside this main function, I'm declaring an array and also I'm initializing this array with these values. Okay. These are all integers. That's why the data type must be integer. Also, the length must be 9 because there are total 9 numbers in this list. This is the original list which we have seen in our question. Right? After that, we require one variable, that is i, which is required in our for loop. Okay? First of all, I would like to print these numbers, and then after that, I will print the reverse of these numbers. Okay? So, in order to print these numbers in original order, I require a for loop that will run from 0 to 8, right? And it will print all these numbers in original order. That means starting from 0, it will print a0 first. That means this element, then it will print a1, then a2, then a3, then a4, and so on. This for loop helps us in printing these numbers in original order. After this, I require this slash n. This will print the new line. Means, after printing this original order, we have to print the reverse order. Both original order and reverse order should not come in the same line. That's why I require this new line. Okay? Then, I am going to print the elements in reverse order. If you want to print the reverse order, then we have to start from index 8. Isn't that so? Because this is the last element and this should come first. Therefore, we have to start from index 8. Then we have to decrease the index 8 by 1 in order to get 7. Then again, we have to decrease the index by 1 in order to get 6 and so on. This is quite clear that i must be 8 initially and Instead of increment operator, it must be decrement operator, right? What about the condition checking? What should be the condition? Condition cannot be i less than 9, right? In this case, i is less than 9 because when it reaches 8, it has to stop. Here, when it reaches 0, it has to stop, right? Therefore, condition must be i greater than or equals to 0. Simple. You are starting from 8, right? You are decrementing it one by one. This means from 8 you will reach to 7, then 6, then 5, then 4, then 3, then 2, then 1. And finally we reach to 0. Right? When it reaches 0 it has to stop. This means when i becomes 0 it has to print that value. And then after that it has to exit from the for loop. So it is quite clear that how our for loop looks like. It will run from i equals to 8 to 0. Okay? And whatever is there inside this for loop is same as this for loop. Now let's execute this code to see whether this program runs fine or not. Yes, it works fine. This is the original list and this is the reversed list. Okay friends, this is it for now. Thank you for watching this presentation.
In this lecture, we will try to understand how we can write a program to find repeated digits in a number. So let's get started. Write a program to check whether any of the digits in a number appears more than once. Like for example, suppose user inputs this number 67827. We need to identify whether any of the digits in this number appears more than once or not. As we can clearly see 7 appears more than once, therefore the output must be yes. I would encourage you to pause the video for a while and try to write a program to perform this task. I hope you're done. Okay. Now let's try to understand how we can write a program to check whether any of the digits in a number appears more than once. I'm going to divide my program into three parts in order to understand it in a better way. And here is part number one. I've declared an array scene of length 10 and the data type of this array is integer. And I have initialized this array with value zero. This means all the locations of this array must contain value zero. This means something like this. Obviously, it is just a small chunk of this array. The question that immediately arises is that why I want to initialize this array with value 0. Let me explain this with the help of an example. Suppose user inputs this number 23 and I need to find out whether this number contains any repeated digit or not. In order to do that, I have to traverse each and every digit of this number, right? Now we know already that digits can be between 0 to 9 only. Whenever I find out a digit, I will go to the particular index corresponding to that digit. That means if I find 3, then I will go to index 3 and I will replace this 0 by 1. 1 means I have seen the digit and 0 means I have not seen the digit before. Now you can understand why I have mentioned the length as 10. Because there are total 10 digits possible from 0 to 9. Right? And whenever I find out a digit, I will go to that particular index and I will replace value 0 by 1. That is why the name itself suggests seen. Whenever you find out a digit, you will replace 0 by 1. And if you haven't seen that digit before, then it is already filled by value 0. Initially, no input is given by the user. Therefore, all the locations must contain value 0. This means I have not seen any digit yet. This record is important to maintain because it helps us in finding out whether I have seen the digit before or not. If I have seen the digit before, then it simply means that that digit is repeated. And I will simply stop my program and say yes, I have seen the repeated digit in a number. Now, after understanding this part 1 of the program, let's try to understand part number 2. This is the main code of this program, the main logic n depicts the value which is entered by the user. Let's suppose user inputs 23, then n contains value 23. Now as 23 is greater than 0, therefore condition is satisfied and we will come inside this while loop. And we will simply divide this number 23 by 10 and we will store the remainder inside rem variable. Why this step is required? Because it helps us in getting the last digit of this number. That is why I am dividing this number by 10. Okay? So when I divide 23 by 10, it gives me remainder 3. And I will store this remainder inside rem variable. Then, as we can see, we have an if construct. And inside this if construct, we are checking this condition. Is seen rem equals to 1 or not? This means, have you seen this digit before? Seen 3 means, I will go to that particular index and I will take the value which is stored inside this location. Here we can see we have value 0 and 0 is not equals to 1. Therefore, the condition is not satisfied. This simply means I have not seen this digit before, right? As the condition is not satisfied, therefore this statement will not execute and hence we will land at this point. Here, this line means that replace this value 0 by 1. Go to the third index and replace the value that is stored in that particular location by 1. After this step, we have another step which says we need to divide that number by 10 and store the number inside n. This means I will divide 23 by 10 and 23 by 10 will leave the quotient 2 and that 2 will get stored inside n variable. I will again check this condition. Again this condition is satisfied and I will divide this 2 by 10 and store the remainder inside the rem variable. Remainder now comes out to be 2. That is this digit right? 
Now I will check whether I have seen this digit before or not. I have not seen this digit before, therefore the condition is not satisfied and hence I will land at this point. This means I will replace this value 0 by 1. Because I have seen this digit now, right? I will divide this digit by 10 which gives me the quotient 0 and it will get stored inside this n variable. 0 is not greater than 0, hence we come outside of this while loop. Now this is clear that when n is equals to 0, then it means that we have traversed all the digits and we simply come out of this loop without seeing any repeated digit. Now after understanding this part of code, let's now dive into the part number 3. In this code, we can clearly observe there are basically two cases we need to address. First is when n is greater than 0 and we simply break out of this loop. When n is greater than 0 and you have encountered a digit which you have already seen, then you simply break out of this loop, right? And the previous case that we have seen is when n becomes 0 and we come out of this loop. We already know when n is equals to 0, it indicates that we have not seen any repeated digit. But what happens when n is greater than 0 and we break out of this loop? This means we have seen the digit already. That is why with the help of this break statement, I am coming out of this loop. Let's consider one example in which we have seen the digit and in that case n is greater than 0. Suppose user inputs this number 1, 2, 3, 2. Now initially I will divide this number by 10 and store the remainder inside rem variable. I will divide this number by 10 and it gives me remainder 2. 2 is the last digit of this number, right? Now I will check whether I have seen this digit before or not. I have not seen this digit before, right? Therefore this condition is not satisfied and hence I will replace this value 0 by 1 because now I have seen this digit. Again I will divide this number by 10. Now this time I will store the quotient inside n. It gives me the quotient 123 after dividing by 10. I will again check this condition. Is 123 is greater than 0? Yes, it is greater than 0. Therefore I will come inside this while loop and divide 123 by 10. It gives me the remainder 3. That is the second last digit. Now I will check whether I have seen this digit before or not. I have not seen this digit before, therefore I will replace this by 1 according to this line. Now I will again divide this number by 10 and store the quotient inside variable n which is equals to 12. Now 12 is again greater than 0, right? And I will divide 12 by 10 and store the remainder. It gives me remainder 2. Now I will check whether I have seen this digit before or not. Yes, I have seen this digit as indicated over here. As rem is equals to 2 and seen 2 means I will go to that particular location and access the value that is stored in that location which is equals to 1 and 1 is equals to 1, right? That means I have seen this digit before. Now as condition is satisfied, therefore with the help of this break statement we come outside of this loop and you can clearly see that n is also greater than 0. This is always the case. When you are breaking out of this loop in between, then this is always the case that n is greater than 0. It is clear from this fact that when n is greater than 0 and you are coming out of this loop, this means that you have seen the repeated digits in a number and hence the output must be yes. And when n is equals to 0 and you are coming out of this loop, this means that you haven't seen any repeated digit in a number, right? And you must output no, okay? Now let me give you the final part 3 code. If n is greater than 0, then we must print yes. Otherwise, we will print no. Now let me combine all the three parts and execute them to know whether our code works fine or not. I have specifically mentioned all the parts of this particular program. This is part 1, this is part 2 and this is part 3. And here, there are two extra lines in which I am asking the user to enter the number. Rest of the code is same as what we have seen already. Okay? Now let's execute this code. Let's suppose we enter the number 67854. It says no, which is correct. Let's execute this code once again. And this time I'm entering the number 6756. It says yes. 6 is repeated over here. Okay friends, this is it for now. Thank you for watching this presentation.
in this presentation we will learn how to use size of operator with arrays so let's get started let me ask you one question how many elements are there in this array after taking two or three minutes you can answer this question right but let me apply the same question to this array as well can you answer this how many elements are there in this array i know i know you are angry on me right but don't worry size of operator is here to rescue with the help of this sentence you would be able to calculate how many elements are there in that array and any array okay you just have to specify the name of the array inside size of operator and you also have to specify name of array along with square brackets and the index inside the size of operator and then you have to divide both okay i can explain this why this works but in order to explain this i am going to divide this sentence into two parts this is going to be the first part and this is going to be the second part okay let me explain the first part and then the second part and then i will combine both of them together in order to understand why this works okay let me explain the first part to you size of name of array suppose we have an array like this and there are total 10 elements in this array what is the size of this array there are total 10 integers right and i'm assuming that each integer requires 4 bytes then we can easily calculate the size of this array by multiplying 4 with 10 it gives me 40 bytes we already know size of operator gives you the size in bytes and as we are assuming that each integer requires 4 bytes and there are total 10 integers in this array therefore the size of this array is going to be 4 into 10 which is equals to 40 bytes right so this is clear let me explain the second part to you size of name of array along with square brackets and the index what does it really mean i'm taking the same array which consists of 10 elements what is the meaning of size of a0 a0 means first element right and because it is an integer and we are assuming size of this integer is 4 bytes therefore we know size of this element will be 4 bytes right so the second part of this sentence is also clear size of a we already know it is 40 bytes in this case and size of a0 is 4 bytes in order to calculate how many elements are there in this array we need to divide 40 by 4 which gives me 10 which is the correct answer but why this works in order to calculate size of whole array we need to multiply size of one array element with number of elements isn't that so if we want to calculate number of elements we need to divide size of whole array by size of one array element and that is what we are doing here right size of name of array means size of whole array and size of name of array with square brackets and the index means size of one array element and you are dividing both of them in order to calculate the number of elements for the sake of simplicity i am mentioning zero over here you can mention 1 2 3 4 it is up to you and why the index doesn't matter because we just want to know size of one element and it can be any element of the array but better is to choose zero now with the help of the code let's see whether this sentence helps us in calculating the number of elements or not here you can see the array that we have seen in the first slide right with the help of this printf function we want to print the number of elements that are contained in this array and we can calculate the number of elements with the help of the sentence size of a divided by size of a0 okay let's execute this code now okay there are total 152 elements in this array okay friends this is it for now thank you for watching this presentation ilan kung ilan ilan ang meron kasama yan ila simple in this presentation i will introduce you to the multidimensional arrays so let's get started First I will define multidimensional array and then I will give you the syntax of the multidimensional array. Let's first define multidimensional arrays. Multidimensional arrays can be defined as an array of arrays. You can think of multidimensional arrays as the combination of multiple arrays, okay? Apart from this the general form of declaring n dimensional arrays is as follows. You have to specify the data type, then the name of the array and then these square brackets and inside these square brackets you have to put these sizes. That is the number of elements. Like for example, suppose I want to declare a two-dimensional array, then it should look like this. You have to specify the data type, the name, and these sizes. Okay? If you want to declare a three-dimensional array, then it should look like this. And for four-dimensional array, you have to specify one more size. Okay? 
I will discuss in details about them in the upcoming lectures. Like what is two dimensional array and what is three dimensional array. Okay, I will discuss them in the upcoming lectures. After defining the multidimensional array and giving the syntax, let's now try to understand how we can calculate the size of multidimensional arrays. Size of multidimensional array can be calculated by multiplying the size of all the dimensions. You can calculate the size of multidimensional array by multiplying the size of all the dimensions. Like for example, suppose I want to calculate the size of this particular array, then I just have to multiply these two sizes, that is the number of elements. It gives me 200 which is the total number of elements it can contain, right? But I want to know the size in bytes. Then I have to multiply 200 by 4, okay? And it gives me 800 bytes. But wait, what is this 4? 4 means the size of one element. 4 here depicts the size of one element, okay? So that is why I am specifying 4 here. And multiplying 4 by the total number of elements gives me the total size, which is 800 bytes. Now suppose, I want to calculate the size of this particular array, then I have to multiply all these three sizes and it gives me the total number of elements. Here size means the number of elements, please remember. And I want to determine the size in bytes, then I have to multiply 800 by 4, which gives me 3200 bytes. Here I am multiplying 800 by 4 because I am assuming that the size of one integer in my machine is 4 bytes. It can be anything, depends from machine to machine. Okay. And please note down that we can store up to 200 elements in this array and we can store up to 800 elements in this array. Now the question that immediately arises is that why we are multiplying these sizes? Why we cannot perform any other operation? We will see why in the next lecture. Thank you. I'm here with Kate and Bea. Bad timing ang kape. Baka dandruff yan? Use head and shoulders. Tanggal ang dandruff that causes kape. Kati gone for good. Dahil 100% dandruff free ka. In the previous lecture, I left the discussion with two questions. The first one is, how to visualize two-dimensional and three-dimensional arrays? And the second one is, why we are multiplying the sizes which are mentioned in those square brackets in order to calculate the size of the array? I'll discuss those two questions in terms of two-dimensional arrays in this lecture. And also, I will discuss more about two-dimensional arrays. So, let's get started. First of all, the basic form of declaring two-dimensional array is, you have to specify the data type, then the name of the array, and then within these square brackets, you have to specify the sizes. X and Y here represents the size, okay? Now, let's address our first question, that is, how to visualize two-dimensional array? Recall that a multidimensional array is an array of arrays, right? A multidimensional array you can imagine as an array of arrays. That is the combination of multiple arrays. And please also recall how to declare a 1D array. We can declare 1D array using this statement. You have to specify the data type, the name of the array, and just a single size you have to mention. And how we can visualize a 1D array? This is the usual way of visualization. We imagine a 1D array as a single row which consists of multiple blocks and the number of blocks is basically equals to the size that we have mentioned. If it is 5, then there are 5 blocks. Okay? This is the way how we can visualize a 1D array. Now, if we add one more dimension here, then it becomes a 2D array. Isn't that so? But how we can visualize it? This simply means we require 4 such 1D arrays which consist of 5 blocks. That is, four 1D arrays, which consist of five blocks each, okay? They are quite far away, isn't that so? Let's see what happens when we combine them together. It forms up a matrix, and the size of this matrix is four cross five. It consists of four rows and five columns, isn't that so? So we can say that a two-dimensional array is basically a matrix, right? Here in this case, it is 4 cross 5 matrix because it consists of 4 rows and 5 columns, right? This is the way we can visualize a two-dimensional array. And how many elements does this array consist of? It consists of 4 into 5 elements, that means 20 elements. So what is the conclusion? This first size means the number of rows and this means the number of columns, okay? 
And in order to multiply the size of any two dimensional array, we have to multiply the number of rows by number of columns. In this case, we will multiply 4 by 5, which gives me 20. This array is capable of storing 20 elements. And if we want to calculate the size in bytes, we will simply multiply 20 by 4. I am assuming here that the size of one element is 4 bytes. Therefore, I will multiply this 20 by 4 and it gives me 80 bytes. So, the size of this array in bytes is 80. Let's see how we can initialize two dimensional arrays. In order to initialize two dimensional array, there are two methods that I'm going to discuss. First method is this. We can initialize two dimensional array by simply mentioning the elements inside these curly brackets. Okay? As this array consists of two rows and three columns, so let me draw them over here. And please note down that index always starts from zero. When I'm saying two rows, the index starts from 0 and ends at 1. And when I'm saying it consists of 3 columns, that means index starts from 0 and ends at 2. And how the elements are stored in this array? The first element stores at this particular location. Second element stores at this location. Third element stores at this location. Fourth element stored at this location. Fifth element stored at this location. And sixth element finally will get stored in this location. Okay? All the elements here will store in a consecutive fashion. But sometimes it is confusing. There is one better method of initialization, which I am going to discuss next. And here is this method. This will also initialize this array in this form that we have seen previously. But the beauty of this initialization is, we can visualize it properly. This depicts the row 1 and this depicts the row 2. Okay? Now after having a discussion on initialization, Let's talk about how we can access 2D array elements. Using row index and column index, we can access 2D array elements. For example, we can access element stored in first row and second column of below array like this. We have to specify the index. That is, row index must be 0 that depicts the first row and column index must be 1 that depicts the second column. In order to access the first row second column element, that is this element, we have to specify the row index as 0 and column index as 1. Okay? Now, after having a discussion on how to access 2D array elements, let's learn how to print 2D array elements. We can print 1D array elements using single for loop. Isn't that so? Like suppose you have this array, which is a single dimensional array. We can access the elements of this array by using a single for loop, which is very easy to write. By initializing i to 0 and specifying the condition as i less than 5, because in this case, the number of elements is 5. And then this increment statement. And inside this for loop, we will use printf function to print all the array elements. Now, in order to print 2D array elements, we will simply use two nested for loops. That is the basic idea. That is, if you have a 2D array like this, then we can print all the elements of this array by using these two nested for loops. Let's see how we can print all the elements of 2D array using two for loops. Please recall that the example consists of two rows and three columns, right? That is, in the conditions, there is a need of writing two here and three over here. Initially, we will initialize this i by zero. And then we will check this condition is i less than 2 or not. Yes, i is less than 2 because i is 0. Therefore, we will come inside this for loop and we will initialize j to 0. After initializing j to 0, we will check this condition is j is less than 3. Yes, 0 is less than 3, right? Again, the condition is satisfied. Therefore, we will land at this point and we will print a i j. This means we will print a 0 0 because i is also 0 and j is also 0. A00 means we are accessing the 0th row and 0th column, that is this element. Therefore, this element will get printed on the screen. And then after that, we will land at this point, that is we will increment the value of j. j now becomes 1. Now we will check this condition is 1 less than 3 or not. Yes, 1 is less than 3, therefore condition is again satisfied. We will come at this point, we will print A01, that is 0th row and 1st column this element. We will print on the screen. After this, again, we will increment the value of j. j now becomes 2. 2 is less than 3. Again, the condition is satisfied. Therefore, we will print the element stored at 0th row and 2nd column. That is this element. 
this element will get printed on the screen. After that, again, we will increment the value of j. j now becomes 3. 3 is not less than 3. Condition is not satisfied. Therefore, we will come outside of this for loop at this point. After this for loop, we won't find anything. Therefore, we will increment the value of i next. i now becomes 1. 1 is less than 2. Isn't that so? Condition is satisfied. Therefore, again, we will go inside this for loop and again, we will find the for loop. This means the j will again get initialized by 0. Please note that i is 1 in this case and j will again get initialized by 0. Again, we will check the condition. Is 0 is less than 3? Yes, 0 is less than 3. Condition is satisfied. Therefore, we will print the value stored at row index 1 and column index 0. That is this element. This element will get printed on the screen. After that, we will again increment the value of j. j now becomes 1. 1 is less than 3, condition is satisfied. Therefore, we will print the value stored at row index 1 and column index 1. Row index 1, column index 1, that means this element, 5, will get printed on the screen. After that, we will increment the value of j again, and j now becomes 2. 2 is less than 3, condition is satisfied. We will go inside and print the value stored at row index 1 and column index 2, that is this particular element. This will get printed on the screen j now becomes 3. 3 is not less than 3, right? Condition is not satisfied. And hence, we will come outside of this for loop. That is, again, we will increment the value of i. i now becomes 2. Because previously, the value of i was 1. Now, it becomes 2. 2 is not less than 2. Condition is not satisfied. Therefore, we will come outside of this for loop. And hence, the program finishes its execution. Okay? Therefore, the final output is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. That is, all the elements which are stored in this 2D array. This means that this nested for loop structure helps us in printing all the elements of this array. Okay? What we have learned so far? We have learned that how to declare and define 2-dimensional array. Then we learned how to visualize 2-dimensional array. Then we learned how to initialize 2-dimensional array. Then we have learned how to access two-dimensional array elements. Then finally, we learned how to print two-dimensional array elements. Okay friends, this is it for now. Thank you for watching this presentation. Hey guys, I'm here with Kate and Bea. Bad timing ang kate. <laughs> Baka dandruff yan? Use head and shoulders. Tanggal ang dandruff that causes kate. Kati gone for good. Dahil 100% dandruff free ka. In this presentation, I'm going to discuss about the three-dimensional arrays. So let's get started. How to visualize a three-dimensional array? If I want to visualize a two-dimensional array, I can visualize it in this way. This two-dimensional array consists of three rows and three columns, right? It is just a simple matrix. But what happens if I add one more dimension here? Then it becomes a three-dimensional array, isn't that so? What does this statement say? It says that I want two such two-dimensional arrays which consist of three rows and three columns. That means something like this. Two two-dimensional arrays which consist of three rows and three columns. Now, I want to access the element in the first row and third column of the first 2D array. In order to do that, I have to specify something like this. Here 0 indicates the first 2D array, this 0 indicates the first row and this 2 indicates the third column. That means finally, I would be able to access this particular element, right? Now after understanding this, let's try to understand how we can initialize a 3-dimensional array. If you want to initialize a 3-dimensional array, there are basically two methods. And here is method number 1 which says that if you want to initialize a three-dimensional array, then simply specify all the elements in a sequence. Then these elements will get stored in a contiguous fashion in this array. But obviously this is not a best method, because we won't be able to visualize how these elements will get stored in this 3D array. In order to visualize that, there is another method. In this method, as we can see, these flower brackets indicates that this is our first 2D array, and these flower brackets indicates that this is our second 2D array. This is the first row of this first 2D array and this is the second row of the first 2D array. Similarly, this is the first row of the second 2D array and this is the second row of the second 2D array. Okay? This is obviously the better method. 
Now, after understanding how we can initialize the three-dimensional array, let's try to understand how we can print the elements of the 3D array. Recall that in order to print the elements of one-dimensional array, we have to use a single for loop. That means something like this. A single for loop helps us in printing all the elements of a one-dimensional array. And if we want to print all the elements of a two-dimensional array, then we can print that with the help of two for loops, right? Now you can guess that in order to print the elements of a three-dimensional array, we require three for loops. Now my target is to print all the elements which are stored in this particular array. Please note down that here we are having two two-dimensional arrays which consist of two rows and three columns. Here I indicates the 2D array index, J indicates the row index and K indicates the column index. Okay. Now let me simulate the whole process so that we can better understand how these elements will get printed on the screen. As i is initialized to 0, that means we want to access the first 2D array first. And we can check that 0 is less than 2, right? Therefore condition is satisfied. Therefore we will come inside this for loop and in this for loop we are initializing j to 0. That means we want to access the first row of this first 2D array. j is less than 2, that is 0 is less than 2, condition is satisfied. We will come inside this for loop and here we will encounter another for loop which is containing k. k indicates the column index, right? And k is also initialized to 0, that means we want to access this particular element. 0 is less than 3, right? Condition is satisfied. Therefore, we can print a, i, j, k, which means we can print this particular element on the screen. After printing this element, this k will get incremented. Now k becomes 1. 1 is less than 3. Condition is satisfied. Therefore, this time we will print this element. Please note down that i is 0 and j is also 0 while printing this element. That means we are still in the first 2D array and the first row but k will get incremented. That means column is incremented. That means we are jumping from this position to this position. Simple, isn't that so? Now the k will get incremented again. k now becomes 2. 2 is less than 3. Condition is satisfied. Therefore, we will jump to this particular location because we are still at first row of this first 2D array. Only the k will get incremented, right? Therefore, this element will get printed on the screen. After that, k will again get incremented. But this time k is now 3. 3 is not less than 3. Condition is not satisfied. Therefore, we will exit from this for loop. And this means this time we will increment the value of j. This means we will jump from first row to second row. After incrementing, j becomes 1. 1 is less than 2. Condition is satisfied. Therefore, we will come again inside this for loop and k will again get initialized to 0. That means we will again start from the first column itself. But this time we are in the second row of this first 2D array. As k is 0 and 0 is less than 3 condition is satisfied, we know that this element will get printed on the screen. Similarly, after the increment of the k, these elements will get printed on the screen. Then again the condition will get failed when we reach at k equals to 3. 3 is not less than 3 condition is not satisfied, therefore we will come outside of this for loop. And again we will increment the value of j. This time j becomes 2 and 2 is not less than 2. Therefore the condition is not satisfied and hence we come outside of this for loop and now we will increment the value of i. Because there is the need to come to this second two dimensional array. i will get incremented means that i now becomes 1. 1 is less than 2 condition is satisfied. Therefore we will again come inside this for loop and again j will get initialized to 0. This means that we are now in the first row of the second two-dimensional array. 0 is less than 2, condition is satisfied. We will again come inside this for loop. k is again initialized to 0. That means we are now in the first column of the first row of this two-dimensional array. 0 is less than 3, condition is satisfied. We come inside this for loop and we will print this particular element that is 7. After this, k will again get incremented k now becomes 1, 1 is less than 3, condition is satisfied, we will print this particular element next. Then we know the next element which will get printed on the screen is 9. 
After this condition is failed, we will come to this point. J will get incremented. Means that we will come to the second row. 1 is less than 2. Condition is satisfied. Therefore, we will again come inside this for loop. And again, value of K will get initialized to 0. This means now we are in the first column of the second row. Right? Therefore, this element will get printed on the screen after this condition is satisfied. And now we know that these elements will get printed after printing 10. After this condition fail, we'll come at this point, j will again get incremented, but 2 is not less than 2. Condition is not satisfied. Therefore, we'll come outside of this for loop. And after that, we will increment the value of i. i becomes 2. And again, 2 is not less than 2. Condition is not satisfied. Therefore, finally, we will come outside of this for loop. In this presentation, I am going to discuss one question on multidimensional arrays. So, let's get started. Write a program that reads a 5 cross 5 array of integers and then prints the row sum and the column sum. Adja pa ba kayo? <laughs> Hello? Hello class, are you still there? Dita pa po ma. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Medyo pa ba kasi to eh. Marami tong ano array. Uh, maganda tong gamit if you are putting together a table, no? And then you have some summation or interpretation, no? Ayan. Kaya, iniisa-isa natin to. So, kung titignan nyo yung, ano, yung pagkakasunod-sunod, para lang may idea tayo. Um, mag -e end yan hanggang doon sa variable length. Arrays in C. Ayan. So, meron pang, as a multidimensional, 1, 2... 3, 4. Apat na lang. Yan. Okay. And after that, we will practice. Ayan. Promise. Okay. That means I need to take all these integers in a 5 cross 5 array. And then I need to print the row sum and the column sum of these individual rows and columns. Like for example, if I want to calculate the row sum of this row, then it comes out to be 9 plus 8 which is 17. 17 plus 3 is 20 and 20 plus 10 is 30. So row total will be 30 for this row. Similarly, if you want to calculate the column sum of this column, then it comes out to be 8 plus 2, which is 10. 10 plus 3 is 13. 13 plus 15 is 28. And 28 plus 6 is 34. So, column total for this particular column will be 34. I would encourage you to pause the video for a while and try to answer this question on your own. I hope you're done. Okay. Let's move on to the solution now. I'm initializing this array which is a 5 cross 5 array with all the integers which are given in the question. Mm -hmm. Okay. After this, I require two variables, i and j. Here, i indicates row index and j indicates column index. Mm -hmm. This is required to traverse all the elements of this array. Apart from this, I require a sum variable, which will store the sum of each individual rows and columns. And I'm initializing this with value 0. I will tell you the reason why I'm initializing this with value 0. Okay. Now, let's first calculate the row sum. And here is how we will calculate the row sum. If I want to traverse a two-dimensional array, then I need two for loops, right? Where one for loop is nested within another for loop. Here i indicates row index and j indicates column index. The idea is to move the column index while the row index remains static. Then only we can calculate the row sum, right? So for this purpose, I will take i over here and j over here. When i is 0, this will go from 0 to 4. That means it will traverse all the five columns. Inside this for loop, we can see we have one statement which says sum plus equals to aij, which means sum is equals to sum plus aij. i is the row index. When row is 0, column will be 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. That means when row is 0, column will be 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. So we can understand that we are simply accessing all the columns of this row and then we are adding them all together, right? Initially, sum needs to be zero because when we are taking this element, then it should not add to any other element. For this purpose, we will simply add this with zero and therefore the sum will not get affected and hence sum will contain value eight. After this, when second element came, then it will get added with eight and it will give the sum 11. And when third element came, it will get added with 11. 
which gives us 20 right this way we will calculate the sum and after completion of this for loop we will simply print the sum on the screen right and then again we will set this sum to zero because the previous sum which we have calculated is for this particular row and the sum that we have calculated for this row should not affect the sum of the other row that's why we need to set this sum to zero once again right after this the i will get incremented that means we will simply jump from this row to this row right and then again the same process continues this is the way we can calculate the row sum now how we can calculate the column sum the idea of the column sum is also very simple here the difference lies in the for loop as my initial assumption is i indicates the row index and j indicates the column index if i want to calculate the column sum then i have to move my row index and not the column index previously i make my row index static and move wait lang ah jelaine meron pala akong ano itatanong bago yes, natin tumito oh. um meron ka na bang na, no, na receive na notice from from the school regarding dun sa extension <laughs> ng schedule extension ng ay, ay wala pa po wala pa wala pang sinabi Wala pa po binababa. Wala pa binababa. Kasi yung sa graduating, meron na. So, kasi dapat, pagdating sa kanila, uh, last week ng February, de, uh, second week ng February, dapat inaasikaso na malapit na matapos yung mga grades nila. So, kung sila ay nagkaroon ng extension, kayo ba ay magkakaroon ng extension? Wala pang inilalabas na ano? Ay, meron na po yan. May wait lang po. Tignan ko po. Okay. Okay. Kailangan ko lang i-confirm dahil doon sa mga deadlines nung ano. Nung doon ako magbe-base. Mga projects ninyo. Ay! Ah, para doon sa ano. Sorry. Sa schedule ng presentation ng mga projects ninyo. Yun. Marami na nagsasubmit. Yung iba ba nakatapos na? Ano nga yung usapan natin dito? Group ba kayo or individual? Individual, individual. po. Individual. Individual. Oh, Baka bang presentation ito? <laughs> Ilang kayo? 38. Okay. Kaya kailangan magamit natin yung isang yung isang linggo. Kailangan natin malaman yung ano, yung extension. Kain lang natin si Jaling. Ma'am, ano ako na lang po mamaya. O oh, sige, mamaya na lang. Oh, sige. Ipaalala mo sa akin ha, kasi para ma-finalize natin. Kasi meron pa tayong i-ready yung presentation. So, kailangan matapos ko yung... Baiksi lang yung presentation. No? Kasi isang, yung isang linggo, uh, yung schedule natin ng... May schedule natin. Um, uh, one to end. Wednesday at saka uh, ano, Sabado, maubos natin yun para sa presentation. No? Dalawang ano, hati. Ayan. Okay. Sige, tuloy na natin. Jalane ha, usapan yun. Apo. Move the column index, right? But here, I have to make my column index static and I have to move my row index. Therefore, your J needs to be static and I should move from 0 to 4. That is why I put J over here and I over here. When J is 0, I will go from 0 to 4. That means we will simply add all these elements which are there in this column and similarly we will add all the elements which are there in the other columns, right? And the rest of the process is same as what we have seen in the row sum. We will print the sum and then we will reset sum to zero. Okay? Now let me execute this code. In the explanation I have considered the row sum and the column sum separately but here in this code I am combining them together. The row sum is there and the column sum is there. Let me execute this code now. 
रो टोटल कम्स आउट टू बी थर्टी ट्वेंटी सेवन फोर्टी थर्टी सिक्स ट्वेंटी एट एंड कॉलम टोटल विल बी थर्टी फोर थर्टी सेवन थर्टी सेवन थर्टी टू एंड ट्वेंटी वन ओके फ्रेंड्स दिस इज इट फॉर नाउ थैंक यू फॉर वॉचिंग दिस प्रेजेंटेशन From this presentation onwards, we will learn how to write a program to multiply two matrices. And in this presentation, we will start our discussion with the basic understanding of matrix multiplication, and then we will move on to the actual program. So let's get started. Suppose we have these two matrices and we want to multiply them. But before multiplying these two matrices, let me tell you one important fact related to resultant matrix. The size of the resultant matrix always depends on the number of rows of the first matrix. and number of columns of the second matrix in this example we can see the number of rows of the first matrix are 3 and number of columns of the second matrix are also 3 therefore the size of the resultant matrix will be 3 cross 3 okay now in order to obtain the first element of the resultant matrix we will take the first row from this matrix and first column from this matrix and then what we will do is we will take the first element from this row and first element from this column and we will multiply them then we will take the second element from this row and second element from this column and multiply them then we will take the third element from this row and third element from this column and multiply them finally we will add them all to obtain the final result 1 into 1 is 1 1 into 2 is 2 3 into 3 is 9 9 plus 2 plus 1 is equals to 12 therefore 12 will get stored in this particular location of this resultant matrix In order to obtain the second element that is in order to obtain the element at this particular cell we first have to identify the location of this cell we can see that the location of this cell is first row and second column right therefore we will take first row from this matrix and second column from this matrix and then what we will do is we will take the first element from this row and first element from this column and multiply them then we will take the second element from this row and second element from this column and multiply them then finally we will take this element and this element and multiply them and then we will add them all to obtain the final result 1 into 2 is 2 2 into 2 is 4 3 into 1 is 3 3 plus 4 is 7 7 plus 2 is 9 therefore the final result is 9 which will get stored in this location mm -hmm. similarly we can fill this cell as well by using the same procedure which we have done for these two in order to fill this cell we have to first identify the location of this cell we can see that the location of this cell is first row and third column therefore we will take the first row from this matrix and third column from this matrix and again we will perform the same procedure the result comes out to be 11 the rest of the locations we can fill in the same way I will move the slides very quickly and your job is to verify them all. This is our resultant matrix. After obtaining the resultant matrix, let's now try to understand some important points related to matrix multiplication. And here is our first point. In order to multiply two matrices, number of columns of first matrix must be equal to number of rows of second matrix. Let's try to understand this point with the help of an example. Suppose we have these two matrices and we want to multiply them. We can see here the number of columns of this matrix is equals to number of rows of this matrix therefore we can multiply these two matrices there is another way to look into it here we can see number of columns are equal to number of rows right but why we are imposing this condition let's consider another example in this matrix we have three rows and two columns and in this matrix we have three rows and three columns we can see here the number of columns are not equal to the number of rows therefore according to this line we cannot multiply these two matrices but why is it true 
If we want to obtain the first element of the resultant matrix, we have to take the first row from this matrix and first column from this matrix. And then we have to take the first element from this row and first element from this column and we have to multiply them together. Then we have to take the second element from this row and second element from this column and multiply them together. But what happens to this element? This element is isolated. There is no element over here which we can multiply with this element. And you can see here we are traversing the columns one by one and here we are traversing the rows one by one. That is why the number of columns must be equals to number of rows before multiplying the matrices. Okay? Therefore we can say that it is mandatory to have number of columns of first matrix to be equal to number of rows of second matrix. Now let me consider another point. Also the size of the resultant matrix depends on the number of rows of first matrix and number of columns of second matrix. We have already considered this point that size of resultant matrix always depends on the number of rows of the first matrix and number of columns of the second matrix. In this case we can see the size of the resultant matrix will be 3 cross 3. And this is our resultant matrix which we have obtained already. Right? Now let me consider one more example to make this point clear. Suppose we have these two matrices and we want to multiply them. We can see here that number of columns of this matrix are 3 and number of rows of this matrix are also 3. Therefore, we can multiply these two matrices. Right? Now what will be the resultant matrix? Resultant matrix will be a 2 cross 2 matrix. And you can always verify these values on your own. Okay friends, this is it for now. Thank you for watching this presentation. I'm here with Kate. Timbea. Bad timing ang kate. Baka dandruff yan? Use head and shoulders. Tanggal ang dandruff that causes kate. Kati gone for good. Dahil 100% dandruff free ka. In this presentation, I'm going to explain how to write a program to multiply two matrices. So let's get started. We want something like this. We want to ask the user to enter the rows and columns of matrix A. And user will input some values and we have to store these values somewhere. After that, we will ask the user to enter the elements of matrix A and then we will ask the user to enter the rows and columns of matrix B and we will ask the user to enter the elements of matrix B. Finally, we will calculate the resultant matrix by multiplying these two matrices. Okay? For better understanding, I am going to divide my program into three parts and here are those parts. In part 1, I will explain how to ask the user to enter the rows and columns of a particular matrix. In part 2, I will explain how to ask the user to enter the elements of a particular matrix. And in part 3, I will explain how to calculate the resultant matrix. Let's see part number 1. As I told you in part 1, I am going to explain how to ask the user to enter the rows and columns of matrix A as well as B. And how to store these values which are entered by the user. For this purpose, I will take a matrix A because I am here taking the example of a matrix A. The same procedure will be applicable for the matrix B also. Okay? Here I am taking matrix A also. I am taking two variables A rows and A columns where I will store the number of rows of matrix A and number of columns of matrix A which are entered by the user. Okay? In the printf function, we will ask the user to enter the rows and columns of the matrix A and then we will take the inputs which are entered by the user inside these variables A rows and A columns for matrix A. Okay? For matrix B, this will change to B. This will also change to B rows and B columns. And similarly, this will also change to B rows and B columns. Okay? Let's see part number 2. In part 2, we will ask the user to enter the elements of matrix A and B. I will explain this process for matrix A. The same process is applicable to matrix B as well. We will first ask the user to enter the elements of matrix A and with the help of two for loops, as we already know, we can input the elements which are entered by the user inside the matrix A. This is very simple to understand. I have already explained this process in the previous lectures. So it is not very difficult to understand. Okay? Now let's see part number 3, which is the most important part. That is to calculate the resultant matrix. This is our resultant matrix we want from these two matrices. Let's see how we can calculate this resultant matrix. For this purpose, first of all, we require one array which will store the values of the resultant matrix. Okay? And then we will require one variable called sum and I am initializing this sum to 0. 
Now, recall the process which we have followed for the multiplication of these two matrices. First of all, in order to calculate the first element of the resultant matrix, we have to take the first row from this matrix and first column from this matrix. That is, we require two for loops for this purpose, which will keep track of number of rows from the first matrix and number of columns from the second matrix. Apart from this, we know that we have to take one value from here and one value from here. In order to take these two values, we require just one for loop. Because when we are traversing the first column of this row, we have to simultaneously traverse the first row of this column, right? And then if you recall, after multiplying these two values, we have to take these two values. This means when we are at the second column of this row, then simultaneously we are in the second row of this column. Therefore, a single for loop is required to keep track of this. Here I am taking B rows. You can take A columns also. Because we are traversing the columns of the matrix A and simultaneously we are also traversing the rows of the matrix B. And number of rows of matrix B are equal to the number of columns of the matrix A. Therefore, we can take B rows or we can take A columns. There is no problem. Now, inside this for loop, this statement is required. Sum plus equals to AIK into BKJ. What does it mean? Index I indicates the row number of matrix A and index J indicates the column number of matrix B. Initially, we are in the first row of matrix A and first column of matrix B. Here we are taking the K because we have to traverse the columns of this row one by one and simultaneously we have to traverse the rows of this matrix one by one. For matrix B, we are taking K over here, right? Now let's see how it actually works. When I is 0, J is 0, K is also 0. That means all these indexes are 0. We are in the 0th row and 0th column of this matrix. That is, we are taking this element. And in matrix B, we are at 0th row and 0th column. That means we are taking this element. We will multiply them together and then finally we will add this with the sum variable. Sum variable initially contains value 0. Therefore, the result will be 1 only, which will get stored inside sum variable. Then after that, we will increment the value of k. k now becomes 1. will come inside this for loop. And now, we are in the 0th row and first column. That means we are taking this element from this matrix. And as k value is 1 and j is 0, we are simply accessing this element from this matrix. Which means, the next values which will get multiplied are 2 and 1. 2 into 1 is 2, so 2 will get added to the sum. Sum previously contains value 1. Therefore, 2 plus 1 is equals to 3, which will get stored inside some variable. Then after that, we will increment the value of k, and then again we will check this condition. Condition is satisfied. We will come inside, and this time, we are simply accessing this element, because this element is at the index 0, 2. Right? Here also, it is 0, 2. And from the B matrix, we are accessing this element, because this element is at index 2, 0. That is, here also, we are having 2, 0. Right? This means the next elements which will get multiplied are 3 and 3. 3 into 3 is 9. Therefore, 9 will get added to 3, which was the previous value of the sum. 9 plus 3 is 12. Therefore, sum will contain value 12. And this is the value that we want. And now we have to store this value in this product matrix. Therefore, the next step is to store this sum inside product ij. That is product 0, 0. That is, in the first row and first column. After that, sum will get initialized to 0 and the same process continues. Now, let me combine all these parts together and execute the program. Here is our actual program and here we can see I am asking the user to enter the rows and columns of the matrix A and then I am asking the user to enter the elements of matrix A. Similarly, I am also asking the user to enter the rows and columns of matrix B. But there is one change over here. I am also adding this if-else construct. Inside this if construct, I am checking the number of rows of B matrix are equal to the number of columns of A matrix or not. This is required. If they are not equal, then we cannot multiply the two matrices. That is why, if they are not equal, then I am printing the statement, sorry, we cannot multiply the matrices A and B. Else we will proceed by taking the elements of the matrix B. And this is what we have seen to calculate the resultant matrix, right? After that, we will simply print array elements which is the resultant matrix. Okay? Let's execute this code now. Let's enter the values 3 and 3. Then it is asking to enter the elements of matrix A. They are suppose 1, 2 and 3. 1, 2, 1. Then 3, 1, 
2. Then it is asking to enter the rows and columns of matrix B. There are also 3 and 3. Now, I will enter the elements of matrix B. This is our resultant matrix. 12, 9, 11, 6, 7, 7, 10, 10, 14. Which we have seen in our example as well. Okay friends, this is it for now. Thank you for watching this presentation. In this presentation, we will learn the concept of constant arrays in C. So let's get started. Either one-dimensional or multi-dimensional arrays can be made constant by starting the declaration with the keyword const. By simply putting this const keyword in front of the one-dimensional or a multi-dimensional array, we can make them constant. For example, suppose we have this array and we want to make it constant. By simply putting this const keyword in front of this array, we can make this array constant. That is, we cannot change these values anywhere in our program. Suppose we try to change some value, then we won't be able to change it. Like in this example, we can see we want to change this value to 45. Then it will simply produce an error. Let's see what compiler says when we execute this program. Okay, it will produce an error message. Assignment of read-only location A1. You are trying to change a read-only location, that's why it is producing an error. Putting a const keyword in front of this array makes it a constant. Therefore, we cannot change its values anywhere in the program. Now, let's see some of the advantages of constant arrays. It assures us that the program will not modify the array which may contain some valuable information. If your array contains some valuable information and you don't want that information to be changed anywhere in your program, then it assures us that no one can modify the array anywhere in the program. Apart from this, it also helps the compiler to catch errors by informing that there is no intention to modify this array. It helps the compiler to know that the programmer doesn't want the array to be changed anywhere in the program so that it can produce some errors if someone tries to change it in the program. Okay friends, this is it for now. Thank you for watching this presentation. In this presentation, we will learn a new concept called variable length arrays in C. So let's get started. Recall this program in which we have learned that how to reverse a series of numbers. If suppose we have this series and we want to reverse it, that means we want to print all these elements in reverse order, then we can do that by simply writing this piece of code. It says that start from index 8 and go down to index 0 and print all these elements in reverse order, right? We can see here I am specifying the length at the time of compilation, that means at the time of creating the code. But what if user wants to specify this length? It would be much better, right? I don't have to fix this length in that case. For this purpose, I have to change this code a little. This is the piece of code which we have to focus on. Here I'm asking the user to enter the number of elements you want to reverse. Then user will enter the number of elements and then I will specify these number of elements as the length of the array. This array is then called variable length array. What does it mean? It simply means that the length of the array can vary according to the user user can specify its own length at the time of execution. Then we can see in the rest of the code I'm asking the user to enter all the elements and then finally I will print all the elements in reverse order, right? So with the help of this piece of code I would be able to print all the elements in reverse order which are entered by the user along with that the length is also specified by the user. Now let's see what are the advantages of variable length arrays. At the time of execution we can decide the length of the array. There is no need to specify the length of the array at the time of compilation. We can specify the length at the time of execution with the help of variable length arrays. Also, there is no need to choose the fixed length. As I've already talked about it, there is no need to choose the fixed length. Length is specified at the time of execution. Therefore, there is no need to fix the length while writing the code. Even arbitrary expressions are possible. Like for example, 
we can write these expressions and obviously the values to these variables are provided at the runtime okay after discussing all these advantages i would like to specify some points related to variable length arrays variable length arrays cannot have static storage duration recall that by simply specifying the static keyword in front of an object that object will simply have the static storage duration and it simply means that we can retain its value even after the scope in which it is declared is finished variable length arrays cannot have static storage duration if you specify a static keyword in front of a variable length array it will produce the error the name itself suggests that the object must be static but variable length arrays are dynamic in nature this means length is changing according to the user but for static storage length must be fixed therefore variable length arrays cannot have static storage duration okay also variable length array does not have the initializer we cannot initialize variable length arrays at the time of compilation again with the same reason Variable length arrays are dynamic in nature. At the time of execution itself, you are specifying the length, and at the time of execution, you have to enter all the elements. It is not the case that you are specifying the length at the time of execution, and you want to initialize the array at the time of compilation. It does not make any sense. Therefore, variable length array does not have the initializer. Okay? If you try to initialize a variable length array, it will produce an error. Also, if you put a static keyword in front of a variable length array, then it will again produce the error. Okay friends this is it for now thank you for watching this presentation okay there you go and that was the dynamic array 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 okay let's try some exercises ayan andiyan na raw bumalik nandiyan na si Gerald Gerald andiyan ka na magpaaramdam ka nga andito na po ayun okay Okay, so let's do some practice. Okay, gawin natin. Ano muna? Magpakita tayo ng ating solution. No? So let's look at, uh, nakikita nyo ba yung screen ko? Kita? <coughs> Kita po? Yes. Okay, so let's uh, try to evaluate yung first Uh, yung number one. Okay. Write the program in C to store elements in an array and print it. Okay. So, ang test data natin, uh, it put 10 elements in the array. Uh, element. So, naintindihan nyo yung element pa. Yan yung laman ng bawat ano. Um, Doon sa loob ng matrix, no? So, ito ay merong one. The, uh, one, two, three tatlong row at may dalawang column, no? Ayan. Kung tayo nakikinig, no? Ayan. So, ang expected uh, output elements <coughs> in array is 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Ayan. So, tingnan natin yung solution. <coughs> okay. So, magpiprint tayo ng elements na may tatlong, tatlong one yun, diba? Itang bagal. Ganito pala pagka nakaganito, ano? Bagal. Ayan. Bumilis. Okay. So, ang i-input nating elements, ah, dalawang column, dalawang column, ilang row? Ah, ten. Ten rows, no? Okay. So, ang input element ay 10 in the array. Ayan. Okay. So, may dalawang 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So, yan yung lilitaw, no? Okay. So, ito yung pictorial representation niya. Ang ating square, no? 0, 1. A, 0. A, 1. A, 2. A, 3. A, 4. For a five, R D I minus D R A with six element. No, yun yung a six R A elements. Okay, tignan natin yung code. So meron tayo di tong void main. Tapos yung ating int. Ito yung array natin. No yung elements niya na sampu 
tayo, meron tayong I dito. Ipiprint siya. Uh, yung N. Uh, print. Read and print elements of an array. No? And then, ito ay guhit na print. Print F. Okay. And another print F. Okay. These are text. Inputted elements in an array. So, dito lilito yung mga numbers. Numbers ng uh, uh, input. No? And then, meron tayo ditong for loop. Ilan yung for loop natin? Dalawa. Uh, dalawa yung for loop natin for the two uh, two columns. No? Yung isa, yung unang first column. No? And then, yung karuktong, yung second column, dun sa isang for loop. No? So, yung i, pag siya ay nag-equal to zero, next, and then yung i, na yung ating variable na i, uh, pag siya ay less than 10, and then may increment, okay, dalawa, and then ipiprint yung element, and then i, no, and it's scan f. Ayan. So, ito yung elements ng array. Ito yung second column. Okay. Yung i, pag nag-equal siya sa 0, and then yung next, yung i is less than 10, and then i is increment, incremented. Ha. Ayan. And then, pag na, nangyari na yan lahat, no, then you will have the output. Okay, tingnan natin yung code. Okay. Sana pareho rin ito nung sa Google, no? Bawat bukas ko ng ano, pareho lang. Teka lang, ha? Tingnan natin. Nakikita natin kung pareho lang. Ganun din lang yun, no? Nakikita nyo yung Debsi ko. <coughs> Class. Yes po. Okay, so pareho rin lang ng sa ano. Okay. Okay, so ito ay array. First example ng array. Lipat natin sa C. Array. One. Sige ako ng period. Another period. Ayan, save. Teka lang ha Higayin natin para hindi tayo malingaw dun sa ating ano Aba Okay Okay so element Ang ilalagay natin ay 1 Okay 1 Nasusundan nyo ba? Nakikita nyo ba pareho yung screen? <laughs> Nakapatong lang ako para hindi ako nalilito dun sa ano. Nakikita pareho? Yung isa yung ano natin. 2, 3, uh, uh, and then 3. Teka, teka. Nung nagkamali ako. Ayan, tuloy. Uh, dapat 2 yung in-encode ko dun. Uh, i-close natin. <laughs> Close! Ulit! Nasa na yun? Nasa na yun? Nasa na yun? Debsy. Ayun, Debsy. Okay, run ulit. Palit talaga ni Miss Payne. Ayan. Okay, ulit. Nakakalito. Ang dami kasing ini-encode. Ayan. One. Tapos, Enter. Another one, enter. Two, at saka two. Ayan. Three, at saka three. Ayan. Four, at saka four. Five, at saka five. Six, at saka six. Seven, at saka seven. And then, eight, at saka eight. And nine, at saka nine. Ayan. So, dapat ang lilitaw. 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Ayun. Okay, tumama. Ayan, tumama na tayo. Alright. 
Okay. Kita ba, class? Hello? Are you there? Are you there, people? May internet ba ako? Hello? Mag-reply? Oo, ba ako. Kala ko, saya ako lang mag-isay. <laughs> Malay mo, nabubutod na nila yung internet ko. Okay. Sige, ang kulat talaga, Miss Payne. O, isa pa, isa pa, isa pa, bago kayo. No? Ano ako, natotorture. Pag tumatahimik kayo, alam ko na eh, medyo nahihirapan na kayo eh, no? Ayan. O, sige, isa pa. Bago tayo mag-sample na sa inyo. Ayan. Teka. Ito. Okay. Let's look at number 2 naman. Ayan, number 2. Ayan natin yan, number 2. So, write a program in C to read n numbers of values in an array and display it in reverse order. Ayan, reverse order. Naalala nyo kanina, may sample ng reverse order dun sa ano, ha? Okay. So, ito yung ating test data. Input number of the elements to store in array 3 and input 3 numbers elements in an, in the array. No? So, meron tayong uh, 0, 2 element 1, 5, element 2, 7. No? So, ang expected output, the values stored in the array are 2, 5, 7. And dun sa kabila, dun sa reverse, 7, 5, 2. Ayan. So, tingnan natin yung solution. Okay. May sikat ba sa bukang trust na kata? Ayan. So, ito yung... Uh, pictorial representation ito, no? So, meron tayo dito. Ayan. So, ito yung pagpagre-reverse, no? Uh, ito yung array natin. Array elements, no? A, A0. Array 1. Uh, array 0. Array 2. Array 1. Array 2. Array 3. Array 4, no? So, may mga values dyan, 5, 2, 7, 9, 6, no? So, yung 1 dash the array with 5 elements, ayan, A5. Okay. Now, para siya mag-reverse, no? Iikot lang siya, no? Uh, pa Iikotin lang siya para magsimula siya sa 5. Et, eto, nagsimula siya sa 5. Pag-reverse niya, yung dulo. Ayan. 6. Ito naman magiging 5, no? So, yan yung reversal niya. Now, nasa na yun? Ayan. So, ito yung ating output, no? Yan yung ilalagay natin. Uh, meron tayong uh, 1, 2, 3. So, 3 rows and then meron tayong dalawang columns dun sa ating array na ating i-reverse. -re okay. So, ito yung code kataas sa kabilang klase siguro yung nakapag ano na ako umabot na ako ng ari ito yun eh Ayan. okay so dito sa ating ano code okay void yung ginamit nya void main no so yung ating int na mga variables we have i n at saka ito yung array Nag naglagay siya ng values na 100 Wow, laki. And then, meron tayong ditong printf. No? Lilitaw lang yan dun sa ano. And read number of values in an array display in reverse. Ayan. And then, yung guhit. Ikita nyo rin yung guhit dyan. And then, printf. Input number of elements to store in the array. Scan f. And then, printf. Number alays na elements. No? And then, ito yung ating for loop. So, meron tayong initialization ng i equal to zero. Yung ating uh, uh, comparison. And then, ayan, yung ating update, no? i is less than n. i, meron tayong increment, no? So, Meron siyang dalawa. Ah, hindi. Hindi lang dalawa. Tatlo. No? Tatlong for loop. No? Pare-pareho lang siya. No? Okay. Ah, ito hindi. Iba ito sa, sa baba. etong sa taas na for loop kapareho nung next. 
etong huli dahil magre-reverse na dito ay iba, no? So yung 4 niya dito ah uh, yung initialization ng i is equal to n and then comparison ng uh, ano, no? Ah uh, yung i is uh, equal uh, no, greater than or equal to 0 and nag-decrement. Dito na nag-reverse, no? Ayan. Okay. So, tingnan nga natin yung code nito. Okay. Copy. Alright. Okay. Source file. Ano makati sa'yo, Nay? Ano makati sa'yo? Ano nga? Dito sa pagitan ng kamay, ang paa ko. Oo, oh, kate, 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 kate. Eh. Bakit makate, Nay? Hindi ko alam. Oh, may errors. Ha? Hindi, zero errors pala. Nakatingin ako sa baba. Okay, so doon tayo sa... Ayan, dito. Okay. So, tana, tana. Input the number of elements to store in the array. Ano raw? Three. Ayan. Enter. Input three number of elements in the array. Element. So, yung ating in, unang encode ay 2, and then 5, and then 7. Ayan. O, di ba? Nag-reverse na siya. Doon siya nangyari doon sa last na for loop. No? So, tama yung ano natin. 2, 5, 7, at saka 7, 5, 2. Okay? Okay? Okay ba, class? <laughs> Mag- Makulit yung aray, no? Kaya nga pinanghuli ko to, eh. Kasi medyo nakakalito to, eh. Now, sige, let's try another. Bago tayo mag-sample sa inyo. Okay, meron pa tayong 30 minutes na pwedeng magamit. Sige. Uh, to, last na to, ha? Last na na, ano? Yung number 3. Last na sample. Okay. Okay, so this time... Uh, itong number 3 na program, write a program in C to find the sum. Sum naman to, no? Sum of all elements of the array. So, kasama yan dun sa diniscuss ni Kuya, no? So, ang ating test data, input number of elements to be stored in an array, 3. So, kapareho ng una. Uh, input 3 elements in the array. Ayan, so meron tayong uh, 1, 2, 3. 3 rows and... 2 columns. No? So, ang expected output natin yan, pag nag-sum ng all elements, is 15. Ayan. Tingnan natin yung solution dito. Ito ako yung pinakamadali eh. Sana ito nalang pinagawa ko sa inyo. Anyway, yung number 4, mukhang maganda rin yun. Interesting. Okay. So, ito yung ating pictorial representation no? Ating uh, exercise. No? So, ayan. So, para makuha yung summation, okay, ito yung ating ano, uh, sum is equal to array 0 plus array 1 plus array 2 plus array 3 plus array 4. Okay, so, 5 plus 2 plus 7 plus 9 plus 6 is 29. Ayun. O, di ba? Napakadali pala nito. Dapat ito na lang ang pinagawa ko sa inyo. Anyway, hanap tayo ng ganito. <laughs> okay, so ito yung uh, ano natin, code natin, no? So, uh, void main, yung simula, no? Yung ating int, ito yung ating array, a, array is, has a value of 100, okay? And then, meron tayong mga variable, i and sum uh, is equal to 0, Okay, ito yung mga print f natin. Sum of all elements of array. Tapos yung n, dito sa taas na variable. And then itong print, 
Ano to is uh, it's a line. Makikita niyo yung line na yan. Print F again. Ito yung input elements number to be stored in the array. Okay. So, yan yung 3. Yung ilalagay natin na 3. And then, scan F percent D and uh, modulo N. Ayan. So, print F. Another encode ng ano ng text, input elements in the array, yung n, yan yung sunod-sunod na ilalagay natin, no? And then, ito yung ating uh, for loop. Isa lang siya. Teka, taas ko nga. Ang bilis naman. Ayan. Isa, ah, dalawa pala. Ayan. So, yung unang for loop ay uh, initialization, no? Uh, i is equal to uh, 0. Ito yung kinompare, no? i is should be less than n. And, nag-increment, no? Yung i. Ayan. Para sa update, no? Uh, and then, print element, no? Uh, minus percent, d, and then i. Ayan. Scan f. Papakita niya lang yung, ano, yung values doon, no? And then, ito yung uh, for, yung, yung for loop na huli, i is equal to 0, uh, i is less than n, and i uh, mag increment no? Plus, plus. Sum, plus, ito na yung ano, ito na yung, uh, ito total niya, yung uh, ano natin, yung uh, uh, total para dun sa mga array, no? Ayan. A, uh, yung array I. Pag nakuha na yung last value ng I, no? Ayan. Print sum of all elements stored in array is, eto na yun, no? Sum. Ayan. Okay. So, tingnan natin yung code nito sa uh, ah, hindi ko nakuha. Dulo. Ito ka. Ayan. Okay. Ay, ay, ay. Ada. Kabilis-bilis naman. Dahan-dahan. Dahan-dahan lang. Okay, copy. Alright, next. Okay, let's try another. Okay. And let's save. And the source file. Array 3. Array. RC. Array 3. And save. Okay. Done tayo sa encode. Para hindi tayo nagkatali. <laughs> Alright. Okay. Let's encode. Okay. So, ang ilalagay natin ay uh, input the number of elements to be stored in the array. So, 3. Ayan. Enter. Element 0 is 2. Ayan. And then 1, 5. And then 2, 8. Yay! Okay. Sum of all elements stored in the array is 15. Ayan. So, nung nag-sum, eto na yung ano dyan. Yan yung sum, no? Yung portion na yan. Ayan. Okay. So, ready na ba kayo? Okay. Meron pa tayong 15 minutes. Kayang-kaya niya yan. Ay, teka lang. Kano oras pa tayo? Ah, hanggang? Excuse po. Hanggang sa is. Hindi <laughs> pa, po, 44 po lang eh. <laughs> Kaya sini nag-excuse. Ako po. Mam, hinanap ko pa po kasi yung uh, bago pong university calendar po na sinend po sa mga president po. Uh -huh. Tapos po yung, ano pong pangalan ito? <laughs> yung adjustment po. Nag-adjust nag po pala talaga yung semester po, yung pagtapos po mga, ah. yung mga pasahan po ng projects. Ganun. So, hanggang kailan? <clears throat> yung nakala... Wait lang po. Open ko lang po yung file. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
para ano kapag usapan na yan um yung uh, nakalagay ko dito December second first semester ends po sa March 5 po uh -huh. tapos yung um, yung February 28 to March 5 po final or departmental examinations of non-graduating students. Uh -huh. Ano pa ka? For years, um February 28 to March 5 po. Ah, okay. Pero yun na po yata yung pag-grade po ata. Oo, oo. So, pareho rin lang sa, ano, sa graduating. Kasi ang graduating hanggang March, yung first week ng March, yun ang naalala ko. Yun doon sa extension oh. nila. Oh. Okay. Uh, Tapos yung may finalization, ay, iba, iba po pala. Sige po, okay na po. Okay. Ayan. So, yung ating, uh, ano, teka, bubuksan ko yung aking kalendaryo. O, oh, diba? So, ito ay February. So, ibig sabihin dito ay ito yung ano natin. Ito na yung week ng presentation natin, no? So, tayo, ang schedule natin ay Wednesday at Sabado. So, yung week ng presentation ay March 2 March 2 and March 5, Sabado. So, kung kayo ay, ano yung final number nyo? 38, di ba? Tama ba? Yes. Okay, so kung 38, ah, 15, tapos, pwedeng, Pwedeng uh, 17, de, 18 plus 18. So, 17 at saka 18. Yung ano, yung unahin na natin yung ano, Sabado para mas mahaba sa Sabado. Yung, yung 18 na yung ano sa Sabado. Tapos yung 17, yung kabila. Tama, no? Tama ba? O kulang? Parang kulang po. Kulang, kulang. Uh, 1836. Uh, 37. 37? Ah, hindi. <laughs> ano ba ginagawa mo, Miss Payne? Nasisira na yung mat mo. Teka nga. So, 38. 38. Divided by 2. If equal to... Bakit ba yan ang binuksan ko? Dapat calculator. Notepad. 19. Alin! Si Ano? Ay! Naririnig... Naririnig nyo ba yung kahol? Naririnig nyo yung kahol? Yung aso? Yes po. So, hindi gumagana yung aking crisp. Naka, walang kwenta tong crisp na to. <laughs> hindi nagiging crispy yung aking ano. Hindi gumagana. Okay, so 1919. Ayan. Tumama na yung aking calculator. Ayan. Okay. So, first set 19, second set 19. Now, kung paano nyo ipapresent yan, hintayin nyo lang. Ibibigay ko yun. Sandali lang yan, hindi ganun kahaba. No? Hindi yan extensive katulad ng mga mga pinepresent sa research na gumawa ng ano ng app. Hindi, san ano lang siya. Simple yung presentation lang kasi marami kayo. Yes. Sino may tanong? Jalen, ikaw ata ay nagtatanong. Ah. Yung ano po ma'am kasi po may issue po dun sa EX file po, uh -oh. pag sinesend po sa um, Gmail. Uh -oh. Kasi po nagiging... Gato na lang. Gato na lang ang gawin nyo dyan. Kasi usual problem niya pati rin doon sa iba, no? So, ang gawin nyo, ilagay nyo sa folder. Ayun nyo sa folder. Yay! Kamay ngay! Kamay ngay! 
Ah, lagay niyo sa folder sa sa Google Drive, no? Sa G Drive. Lagay niyo siya tapos i-share niyo na lang yung link sa akin. That will solve Nag the problem. Nag-try po ako noon, ma'am, na i-upload siya sa G Drive, pero hindi pa rin po naganap. Hindi. Tapat na kasi pa rin siya. Kaya na 'yon. Bago niya Sige, upload, dapat na kasi naka-zip pa rin siya. Hindi rin hindi rin tatanggapin niya ano 'yan eh. Ni Google Drive kung hindi naka-zip. Eh. Apo, naka-zip file po siya. Tara, ay pa rin. Na-detect pa rin po na malware or virus daw po, kaya hindi po siya na-upload. Ah, okay. One last. <laughs> Ganda na lang. Pag bago niyo i-send, no? Ah, uh, i-deactivate niyo muna yung Teka ha, teka, pakita ko na lang sa inyo para, doon do, do lang na sa time na yun eh, kasi medyo sensitive yung ating mga bagong windows, hindi katulad ng mga lumang windows, hindi yan problema, no. Uh, punta ako sa uh, security, okay, security, control panel, pinapakita ko na sa inyo. <laughs> Okay, so security, punta kayo doon sa inyong ginagamit na firewall, no? Ang gamit ko kasi dito ay yung inyong, um, ito turn off nyo lang yung inyong firewall, no? So, i-turn off nyo lang for that time para lang masend. So, pagka tinurn off nyo na yan, hindi na magre-react yan. Yun lang yun. Yan. Last na yun. <laughs> Merong mga PC kasi na madaling mag-send eh. So, iba-iba yung ating uh, gamit na system. Merong hindi ganun ka-sensitive. So, yan. So, medyo siguro sensitive yung, ano, yung setting ng ano mo. O kung sino man yung hindi nakakapag-send. Yun yung last na, na way. Kasi, yung Windows, uh, basta nakakita siya ng e EXE. EXE na pa, tinitreat niya agad na ano, diretso na virus. No? So, i-turn off nyo lang yung uh, firewall na yan. That will go out. No problem. Ma'am, may isa pa pong concern. Kasi po, yes. yung iba ko pong classmates mm -hmm. is, yung Google daw po mismo yung nag- Uh, ano po dun sa file, hindi po yung firewall po nila. Oh Kung baga po yung Google po yung mismong tumatanggi po para i-upload, ma-upload po ata or ma-attach yung files po. Okay. Kung si Google ang aayaw, di, itry natin si... Ano na nga yung isang ginagamit ko na ano? Uh, wait lang. Ano nga yung ano ni... Ano, ni... Ah, ito, one, ah, de, one drive. One drive ba yung, ano? Anong, ano nga yung kay Microsoft na, ano? Na, lalagyan ng, ano? Ay, hindi ko matanday yung pangalan. Ah, teka lang, teka lang. May solution dyan. Yun nga si one drive. Ah, uh, yung pangalan nito. Ito, itong OneDrive na to. Anong pangalan nga nito? Itong, itong cloud na to. Hindi uh, ko malala yung pangalan nito eh. Uh, teka. Tanongin nga natin si Google. MS. Ma'am. Google. Ma'am. Oh, oras na. <laughs> <laughs> Ito, may pangbukas po ba kayo ng... Practice! Nakakainis! MS. Dali lang. Tapusin lang natin to. Tandali lang. Uh, may tanong lang po. Yes. MS. May pangbukas po ba kayo ng zip file? Or RAR? Para... Zip file na lang po yung isesend sa inyo. O oh, sige. Isip nyo na lang. Sige, magda-download na lang ako ng zip. O oh, sige. Ayun, pwede rin. Solusyon din yun. Um... Ano na nga yung iniisip ko? Nawala tuloy yung yung storage yung ni Microsoft. Right. Ayan. Storage na uh, Microsoft MS Storage Storage Online Kailangan ko lang malaman yung pangalan ng lekat na ano na yan eh. Uh, 
Hindi siya assure. Yan nga, Microsoft OneDrive. Wala ba kayo noon? Kasi 'di ba, lahat naman kayo ay ano, ay uh, ano ng school. Lahat kayo may access sa uh, yung mini ano ng Microsoft. So meron kayo dapat nitong ano OneDrive. Pwede niyo i-store yan sa OneDrive. Parang ganito yan, no? Oh. Uh, nasa na yung akin. Ito yun sa akin. Yan, sa Microsoft. Tapos, uh, ito yung meron kayo. Uh, I think pareho tayo, eh. E, nakikita nyo ba yung screen ko? Ito, dito nyo palabasin. Dito nyo ilagay. Tapos, i-share nyo sa akin. Ito, yan yung OneDrive. Online yan, eh. O. Oh. Yan, dito. Dahil, di ba, ang, ang school, binigyan kayo ng, ano, ng access, parang email, email kay Microsoft. Pare-pareho tayo, eh. Ganon din yan, eh. Yan, o. Oh. Yan. Meron kayo nito lahat. Yan. So, pwede nyo gamitin itong OneDrive. Yan. Okay. So, yon Now, si, ano, uh, instead na, ano, in ilagay niya sa zip, Pwede ako mag-open ng zip. Magda-download na lang ako ng ano, pang-open ng zip. Yung pa isa. Okay. Anything else? <laughs> Ma'am, last na po. Yes. Yung sa presentation po ba? Oh. Ano po? Um, di ba po by batch po siya? Yes. So, paano po i-present yun? Like, Exactly. Yung katulad po ng ginagawa po natin sa mga activities, gano'n po. Uh, uh, and then, yes. nga, kung may format akong ipapakita, siguro mga ano lang yon mga limang slide lang yon Maiksi, maiksi lang yon Ang ang focus nun ay ipakita kung ano yung meron dun sa ano nyo, sa ginawa nyong application or software or game or kung ano ba yung ginawa nyo. Yun. Hindi yung ka, uh, very extensive katulad nung ano, nung mga sinasubmit ng mga naggagawa ng research tapos may ano yung kasi may project management eh doon sa inyo hindi kasi ang dami nyo hindi pwedeng ano <laughs> hindi pwedeng extensive kung groups yan pwede pa yan okay yeah, i-share ko yun sa inyo um, taposin lang natin yung ating ano maybe next meeting yeah, next meeting pwede ko na i-share Sige po, ma'am. Thank you po. Ano pa? O, di ba? Hindi na tayo nakapag-practice. <laughs> Ay! Okay. O, sige. Ano, three minutes na lang. Labo-labo niya. Maka-finish niyo agad dyan. Ay, hirap-hirap ng aray. Pinanghuli ko na nga yung aray. Aray ko. Nako, aray na ko. Kasi ang dami nun eh. Anyway. Pansarado yung aray. Tapos, next meeting, yun na nga i-discuss na natin yung ano sige, may practice tayo tapos asa na ba yung ating kalendaryo? total, ubusin ko na lang yung time sa ano sa ating ano so, meron pa tayong uh, one, two uh, three, four four meetings So, meron pa tayong four meetings bago tayo mag-start ng ating presentation. Ang deadline natin, ano ba sabi ko sa inyo sa deadline? Super deadline? 22? Ah, hindi. 23? 23 ba? O 26? Galing, naalala mo ba? Amin di po eh. Hindi nalala. Okay. Sige. I think 26 ata yung sinabi ko. So, 26. Uh, tapos, ire-ready ko na yung presentation. Ibibigay ko sa inyo ng... Pwede ko na ibigay next meeting para mapaghandaan nyo na kung paano nyo ipapresent yung ano nyo. Total, magpa-practice lang naman tayo ng 16. Tapos... Sa so, 19 ay paano gawin yung X eh, and more practice. And then, kung ano man yung mga naiwan natin na kailangan i-clarify. And then, ayun, final na yung ano. Tapos, we can start na yun. So, 3 yung first set. And then, 5 yung next set. Ayun. Okay. So, ayan. Unti na lang. 
Pwede na. Pwede na, pwede na. Tatapos na tayo. Any more question, class? Aray ko. Okay. Ala sa isa. Wala na po. Wala na. Wala na. Okay. Alright. Uh, so, pahingi ako ng mga mukha ninyo. <laughs> Hinihingi yung mga mukha. Paano ko ba gagawin ito na, ano, mapakita ko kayo lahat? Dito, meron dun sa taas, ano. Natuwa lang ako. Pero siguro next meeting, eh, ano, <laughs> balik tayo kay, ano, balik tayo kay, kay Google. Pero maliwanag yung, ano, no, yung boses. Parang alino-linaw nung, ano, nung audio natin. Medyo naglalag lang po yung presentation. Oo, oh, naglalag lang siya. Pero malinaw yung, ano, mas crisp yung, ano, yung sounds. Oh, ayan na. Paano ko ba gagawin to na lahat kayo nandito? Zoom yan. Teams. Uy, pati nga ng hair. Oh, ganda. Ganda. Tinan mo na yun. Tinan mo lang. Teka lang ha, yeah, ano ko lang ito na ano. Nang body. Hindi naman gumagana itong crisp na ito eh. Lagyan lang ng body. Ah. Ah, hindi. Hindi, 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 cancel. Hindi yan, tapos. Teka lang ha, tinitingnan ko kung paano ko gagawin na andito kayo lahat sa isang ano. Ah. Ano itong gallery? Large gallery? Ayun. Large gallery. Ayan. Kita na. Okay. Pwede bang mas malaki? Okay. So, ayan. Kunin ko na yung ano nyo. Uh, Magpiprint screen na tayo. Okay, class. Ngiti-ngiti muna dyan. O, diba? Ang daming gwapo ng mga estudyante ko talaga. O, diba? O, madaming maganda. At saka, mga gwapo. O, ayan. Ayan, ganyan. Okay. Alright. Okay, one, two, three. Smile. Okay, one more. Ayan na. Okay, salamat. Okay, class. Nakuhaanan ko na yung ano. May issue pa ba tayo? Meron pa? Wala na. Okay, so hopefully wala na. Matapos tayo ng maayos. Ayan. Okay, ano pa? Asa na ba yung aking teams? Ayan, teams. So, okay. No more na. Kung wala na tayong pag-uusapan at wala na kayo tatanong, eh di sige, babay na po. Kitakits tayo uli sa Wednesday. Okay. Bye, ma'am. Thank you po, ma'am. Bye, ma'am. Bye, ma'am. Bye, ma'am. Bye, ma'am. Bye, ma'am. Bye, ma'am. Ingat tayo pa lagi. Bye, ma'am. Okay. Teka, papatayin ko yung aking video. Ah, done.